to talk about uh, Libra SSL, uh, which is, I'm sure most of you are probably here know, is the OpenBSD fork of OpenSSL. Um, I'm Bob. Uh, what am I? I'm a consultant, software developer, nerd herder. Uh, I go around and take jobs doing whatever's fun. Uh, so if you have something fun, that's fun. Uh, the history that got me to this place is I installed OpenBSD on a Spark Station One Plus in 1995 because I needed another device that would speak TCP IP for something I was testing. I had a Spark Station uh, and uh, NetBSD wouldn't work on it and so I installed OpenBSD and it worked and then I made the tragic mistake of trying to uh, phone the ad, the, the phone number that Theo Durat had on his website to send him a pizza if you liked it and that sort of ruined my life from there. Uh, having said that, I'm an OpenBSD Foundation director. Uh, I'm one of the guys who handles the, the money end of, of the OpenBSD project, um, such as it is, uh, which usually involves begging for money. Um, and uh, that's where I'm from. And uh, I've done a lot of stuff in there. But uh, more about LibreSSL. LibreSSL is, it's about 30 days old, give or take, about a month. Okay, and uh, we forked it from OpenSSL 1.01G. Uh, which was the current release at that time. Uh, you all know about Heartbleed, unless you've been living under a rock. Uh, Heartbleed wasn't the worst of it, as we'll get into. And it's being, but this is actually being worked on by quite a few OpenBSD developers. Um, there's probably five or six of us that are regularly whacking things in there or adding things to it, and probably 15 or 20 other people regularly poking their heads in and changing the odd thing or, or taking something on. Uh, and interestingly, uh, quite a few people from the outside are giving us stuff that's, that's been very useful. So, but uh, before we get there, everybody asked me this question. Why did we let OpenSSL happen? Okay. And some of you will have been used to working in large code bases, and some of you may not have been used to working in large code bases. And if you are, you probably know you always bring stuff in from upstream. And so I'll say nobody looked, or more likely, we all know the, the answer better. We all looked, and we all wouldn't admit we looked. Okay, oh, I don't want to look at, I don't want to admit I look at that. I know nothing. Okay. And, you know, really why? Because you go into that code base and it is not something you want to wrap your head around. Um, it's why did nobody look? It's important stuff. The code is seriously too horrible. It is your parents talking about where you got made kind of horrible. Okay? My wife and I have this thing that says you make girls in the bedroom and you make boys on the living room floor and neither of my children want to hear about it. So, um, <laughs> OpenSSL is that kind of horror, okay? And uh, you really don't want to go there. And when you do go there, you look into it and you say, oh, there is so much stuff in here. Well, I don't want to have to change it or we won't be able to merge, up, merge the upstream stuff. I sure hope the upstream stuff people are caring and know how to deal with this coding style that they have adopted because, you know, I certainly don't want to change it. And it would be a huge job to have to maintain a downstream fork of it, okay? All of us in every project that uses this, in every commercial product that incorporates this code base, and there are tons of them, we are all guilty. We all walked in there, those of us with commit access, those of us with access to the source code trees in our companies, in our free projects, we walked in there, we looked at that, and we made that face. And we said, oh no, I, I just want to do what I'm here to do. I'm not going to touch that because there lies an infinite tar baby that will suck my time away and it's just a thankless gross job. So honestly that's how it happened and it's not just OpenSSL. It is not an open source thing. Uh, I've certainly been in companies with source code bases where similar wonderful pieces of proprietary code were acquired or merged or purchased and you go look at that and you go, oh I hope they fix that or I hope they're maintaining that because I don't want to. This is not a unique situation in software development by any stretch of the imagination. It's just a rather high profile one at this time. So why is it so horrible? Well, <laughs> we'll get into that, okay? Yeah. So um, for us, when we started doing this, 
Heartbleed. Everybody hears about Heartbleed. Oh, the Heartbleed bug was so bad. How could it happen? Blah. You know, dogs and cats living together. Open source is awful. Um, no. Heartbleed was really not the final straw for us. Heartbleed is a bug similar to bugs we see in software we pick up or is there every day. Okay? It's a pretty common bug. It's a pretty common form of bug. Okay? However, it was made much worse by something else. And for us in OpenBSD, we tend to rely a lot on exploit mitigation techniques in the operating system. We tend to know that we try to review our code thoroughly and stuff we bring in from things like ports and upstream maintainers, at least if it has mistakes, usually when you get to the fact that our address space is aggressively randomized, is aggressively put to a place where malloc moves around, you end up next to dead pages, it's, it's usually likely that if you run a piece of software for any given time on OpenBSD, eventually if it's got issues, it starts to crash. And when it starts to crash, we tend to find these things, find these bugs and push them upstream. Okay. And, and part of that is one of the nice things about OpenBSD that helps make it a more secure platform, even when it is stuff that we actually haven't written or audited and things like that. However, their malloc replacement library really was the final straw for us. <laughs> okay. um, Ted figured it out and posted it. Wonder, like, Ted Unegs is up to the front here. Um, Ted works on this as well and probably has shredded more code out of it than I have. Um, but... Uh, their malloc layer never frees memory. Essentially, they decided malloc is slow on some platforms, so let's assume malloc is slow everywhere. And let's implement our own cache that never frees anything and just reuses the objects. Better yet, the way that it reuses objects is it keeps a last in, first out queue. So if you uh, actually are viewing a use after free, chances are excellent that that object is still there. Matter of fact, it's almost certain that if you free something and use it immediately, that thing is still there, and it doesn't matter that you freed it. Okay? As you can imagine, this made Heartbleed that much worse. Okay? Anything that would have attempted to free memory, you know, recently used keys, bits like that, well, that's still all there. It's still all there in a last in, first out manner, sitting there right in the same chunk of memory that it's allocated. So it made things a lot worse. Uh, and the other great part, and this hasn't really been noticed that much, it included a debugging malloc. The debugging malloc was always there. And if you enabled debugging malloc, it would send all the allocations to a log, the contents. Okay? And you only had to change one word of running memory to make it do that. Okay? So all of a sudden, this isn't just a debugging malloc. This is a potential attack surface. So we didn't like that either. And we started to look at this. And it's wonderful to have these debugging tools. But you know what? The last time I had to write my own malloc and put it in software to debug malloc, I had a mullet and parachute pants. <laughs> we all have LD preload. We all have a million versions of debug malloc. Or our system mallocs do it. We don't need to have this bundled into a cryptographic library that is security sensitive to do these things. So anyway, we looked at this. And uh, I think Ted probably coined the term uh, exploit mitigation technique countermeasures. Um, it really is a very effective exploit te mitigation technique countermeasure. Because when you do this, tools like Valgrind, uh, if you've ever used Valgrind to spot memory problems, it doesn't notice that this is an issue. Because, well, the memory wasn't freed, but it's fine. It wasn't freed. It was just an object it kept using until it exited, right? <laughs> it never sees these free calls. So um, it's kind of a, a big problem. Uh, we kind of went, oh, my gosh. And this was kind of the final straw for us where we decided to do something about it. And uh, meanwhile, in OpenSSL, um, it appeared to be kind of the perfect storm. Uh, developers appear to only be interested in adding features, never removing them. Okay? Removing features is hard. Okay? Changing coding style is hard. Modernizing a code base is hard. It's ugly, nasty work. And you know, everybody says it takes heroes to delete code. Um, their focus appears to be on maintaining a million dollar a year for-profit company doing FIPS consulting gigs. That's what it is. It might be called a foundation, but it's incorporated as a for-profit company in Maryland. Um, Fixes that are sent up were definitely not being merged by the upstream. So we look at this, and any chance we have of potentially 
Um, radically altering how things are done in OpenSSL is probably not going to be merged by the upstream. Uh, given that uh, the, actually the problems in the memory allocator were discovered by, what was his name, Pavel? I, yeah. You don't remember. There was a fellow who actually discovered the problems with the memory allocator that were probably worse than Heartbleed, or at least led to it, four years ago, and had a ticket in OpenSSL's RT that was sitting there for four years. We found it by reading their bug tracker. <laughs> and we fixed it. So, and when you really get down to it, that horrible code that you don't want to look at actively discourages outside involvement. It actively discourages developers and the community from looking at it. Why? We all look at it. We say, I don't have the time and energy to invest to understand this arcane stuff Okay, just to see if it's okay. I'm going to hope the person who writes in this arcane style understands it enough and cares enough to take care of it. Okay, I, I had to laugh at, at our keynote when you know our keynote speaker said, "Oh, it's so good that you know in this modern day and age we don't have to manually encode byte lengths and and you know sizes of word and all that stuff." And I, I had to not snort and giggle because I had OpenSSL code open on my screen that does exactly that. So yeah. Anyway, uh, the only real solution we decided was to grab a big fork. And uh, with the actual bugs in the allocator rotting, it's obvious it's not going to happen. So we wanted to make sure that, uh, that basically the maintainers are not maintaining it. They're just adding to it. So it was, we imported 101G. and. Uh, I think about 30 seconds after Miode pressed the commit button to import 101G, uh, both Theo, I, and you just started tearing things out of it. And we just started ripping and tearing and shredding. Uh, and we didn't say anything or announce anything, but slowly the, the community noticed that there's this massive, you know, these enormous commits happening on the SSL branch in OpenBSD, and you know, the world started to notice. So, Eventually, we got around to announcing that it's Libra SSL, and we'll get into that. But let's talk about what Libra SSL's goals are, at least initially. So our goals with the fork are, first and foremostly, preserve API ABI compatibility with OpenSSL. We want to be a drop-in replacement. There is too much stuff in the ecosystem that already uses this API and ABI. Okay? So it's not like it's going to be easy for us to say, hey, Oh, let's change it to a better API. Trust me, there's a better API. What better API? Pretty much any API might be better than what's there, but that's okay. There's too much effort involved in too many other projects to change that right now, and particularly not as a big step. So we want to preserve compatibility and be a drop-in replacement. Definitely, we want to bring more people into working, in looking at the code base, and understanding what is going on in there by making it less horrible. Okay? And to some extent, we've, we've, we've succeeded a considerable amount in that already. It's actually really cool. Um, unlike the usual OpenBSD commits where we'll toss it around each other, yep, yep, normally we, we review, it's okay, we do it, but we do make, occasionally make mistakes even when we all look at it. And I think we've all had commits where we've said, yep, okay, 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 committed it. And a few minutes later, you know, somebody randomly on the list watching our commits goes, hey, you missed this. You know, dumb little thing. And oh, wow, yeah, I did. It's really nice to have community involvement again. Okay? And that's something that you definitely just don't seem to have uh, with the OpenSSL code base. Definitely fix bugs and modern coding practices. Okay? And try to do portability right. So, before I go on to talk about portability, because we're going to get into why it's so horrible, I have to talk about why, how OpenSSH does portable. Now, this is not OpenSSL. This is OpenSSH. OpenBSD does not have anything to do with OpenSSL. OpenBSD is the source of OpenSSH, which you'll probably all use. It has a mostly pretty good track record. Okay? The first thing is how you do this, how we've done this for OpenSSH for many years, is we assume a same target OS, OpenBSD, of course, for us. And we code to that standard. Pick one, go to it, standard APIs, standard intrinsics, done. Uh, we build and maintain the code on the above using modern C. Adapt when necessary. Finally, to do portability, you provide portability shims that correctly do the things that the other OSs don't provide, and only for those that need it. 
You don't rewrite your own copies of libc string functions just because uh, Linux has decided not to have sterl copy. Okay? You just provide sterl copy if you happen to be building it on Linux. Okay? Uh, don't, wherever possible, no if def maze, no compromise on what the intrinsic functions actually do. Okay? So that means if there's a function called timing safe mem, mem, timing safe mem comp, that probably, that timing safe special variety of it probably means something. You probably shouldn't just make that memcomp, okay? It, it's probably bad. If there's a function we use called explicit b0 that your operating system doesn't have, you might want to check why we chose to call a function called explicit b0 rather than b0 and wonder why we might want to do that. So we'll get to that as well. And definitely don't re-implement libc. But this is how OpenSSH does portable. Okay, and you've probably all seen that. You all use OpenSSH. How does OpenSSL do portable? Well, assume the OS provides nothing because you can't break support for Windows 16 and Visual C 1.52. Um, you, you, heaven forbid, portability being the biggest goal, uh, most laudable goal of, of software development, you have to do that. Um, the spaghetti mess of if, def, if, and def horror. And when I say nested 17 deep, um, <laughs> you've been there, I've been there. It'll be if def open SSL VMS, pound else if open SSL win foo, pound else if open SSL tandem blah, pound else if open SSL blah, pound else, pound if, <laughs> blah blah, pound if and def, pound if. So, so they'll, they'll do, they'll, in the middle of this, they'll trick you. And the goal is to find out in the middle of this half screen of if defs where the thing that finally gives up and says, yeah, okay, it's just POSIX, okay? <laughs> but literally, this, it was throughout this code base. It makes it incredibly hard to read. It makes it incredibly hard to look at and maintain and to even find out when you look at a piece of arcane code, is this being used? Is this not being used? Is this being compiled in, not compiled in? Um, yeah. So I would say it's definitely, their approach to portability is let's write it in a dialect called OpenSSL C. It's not C in the sense that we know it, okay? Sure, it's the C language, but a lot of the normal library functions we know and use are not there, or they're replaced with OpenSSL or crypto or bio versions of it that might work kind of like the way that the standard ones do or might not. We'll get to that. And you implement all those layers and you force all platforms to use it. Again, just because a platform, uh, just because Visual C doesn't, uh, uh, Visual C 1.52 has a linking error when you use SNPrintf, uh, instead we'll do 20 lines of stir copies of bits into stuff and have a comment at the top. I used, did it this way because SNPrintf pukes on Visual C 1.52. Hello, it's probably time to retire that code. Okay. Um, so we did send many things to Valhalla. Uh, EBCDIC support went right away, and a few people noticed that. Um, I killed it. I said, if, I believe I committed it saying that if Norse legends were true, EBCDIC will meet me in Valhalla and we will be friends. That is assuming I die with my fingers on a keyboard. Um, so DOS support of varying varieties. Mac OS Classic for pre-OS 10. I, I hate to announce it. If you've got a Mac SE 30, Libre SSL will not work for you. You will have to run it. You will have to run OpenSSL. I'm, I'm so sorry. Or, or put a fishbowl in it or put an Alex box in it with a screen and run your favorite BSD. Um, Win 16 VMS support. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you can see the bottom. <laughs> um, we can talk a little bit about VMS support. And the VMS support tendrils in there were just astonishing. And, and I say, oh, yeah, we killed that three weeks ago. But, but bits of it still keep coming back. <laughs> we, oh, my god, it's still there. Kill it. Kill it. It keeps coming back. <laughs> Uh, it is the regular Lovecraft uh, quote for Cthulhu, which is, I believe, Cthulhu sits in his house in pound define open SSL VMS and dreams. Um, <laughs> and, and I believe that truly Cthulhu does live in pound define open SSL VMS. It's, there's no question of it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that shortly. 
I, I don't believe so. I believe we just made him go live somewhere else. Please, please go live in another library. Um, yeah. Uh, of course, the memory allocator was an issue. Um, we killed it. Uh, we removed it. We removed the option to compile it in, to turn it on, and we removed the code. Uh, suddenly, security tools started to notice that memory allocation issues are actually at work on this code base. Uh, somebody ran it through Coverity right after we disabled it. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, they, they disabled it too, and then they... Ran it through Coverity, and how many things did they find? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, oh, wow, hey, we, we didn't know this before. Um, excuse me. And, and a few other, there's some people at Stanford with a... Uh, an analyzer who are now running it through it regularly, and they keep feeding us stuff as well. Uh, so more on the allocator, we removed the debug malloc and other nasties inside the library that could send private data to logs. Here's the problem. The wrappers remain. Okay? So crypto malloc, open SSL malloc, open SSL set debug malloc, open SSL halt catch fire malloc debug, <laughs> change at runtime, blah, blah, woof, woof. All of these things are in OpenSSL's exposed header files. And this is the problem we're facing. We don't know which upstream packages actually call these functions and use them. Okay? So in this case, what we did, I think I shredded most of this, uh, was that uh, we simply would defang them. So like the things that say, turn on the debugging malloc mode, it just doesn't do anything. Okay? Uh, the things that say, replace the malloc wrapper at one time, it says, yeah, that didn't work. Go away. Okay, and uh, the actual malloc and free and realloc for, for OpenSSL and crypto are just using the standard intrinsic API from the operating system, not trying to do clever things, okay? Now, interestingly, we've left those wrappers there, but the library internally no longer uses them. So part of our strategy to moving away from it is to, if we don't like this API, we have to keep it for external compatibility, but we're certainly not gonna use it inside. So LibreSSL doesn't use OpenSSL malloc, crypto malloc. There were a few others. There were, there were a number of malloc layers in there. It, you know, oh, I didn't like that one. I'll put, add my own malloc layer. We removed them all. All of the things in there now use malloc, uh, realloc, calloc, realloc, and realloc array, which is actually an API that was added to OpenBSD's libc. It is non-standard. Uh, but it's through a problem that we saw occurring all over the place in OpenSSL and also in other parts of our tree. And this is that, um, well, first of all, what the necessary conversions we always did, malloc plus mem set to zero, we changed those to calloc. Uh, but this one here, malloc x times y, okay? Oh, I have 20 objects. I think I have 20 objects. <laughs> I hope I only have 20 objects. And I hope I only have, you know, of size 30. Oh, but wait, I didn't really know how many I could have. Um, if this, that computation can overflow. And if it does, bad stuff happens, okay? Whereas our calloc has always checked for overflow. And if it would overflow, it returns, it, it fails, okay? And so what we actually did is, the problem is, is people don't want to call calloc with the overflow checking, because they also take the penalty of the memory set to zero. So we actually added a realloc array, which is essentially calloc with bounds checking on the integer multiplication, okay, and then allocate an object of that size without doing the, the memory zeroing, okay. And in case you're wondering why we're paranoid about this, uh, you probably see the Open S OpenBSD web page with only two holes in 15 years. One of those was that. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding, okay? So if you think we're being overly paranoid, no. These are the kind of things that, that cause problems, and we've been bit before, and we won't be bit again. And so, yeah, we, we need that little intrinsic realloc array that does the proper range checking. Uh, realloc and free have handled null since I don't know when, uh, but the code threw out tests for null ahead of time because the OpenSSL variants don't. So we just know. Let's, let's call them no. Call, do, do the right thing. Finally, uh, entropy. Uh, entropy is a fun thing that is used to generate keys, and particularly with SSL, generate ephemeral keys. Because your key, your private key is used in SSL negotiation to do the initial, initial, hello, hi, I'm there. Are you really who you say you are? Here's a certificate and all that good stuff. But the actual encrypted encrypted stream is just encrypted with a symmetric cipher with two randomly chosen keys at each end, 
Okay? And those randomly chosen keys need to come from an entropy source. And that entropy source had better be pretty good. Obviously, if you can predict what the random number generator was seeded with and what it will do, you can have a good idea to predict what the key will be. And then, who cares how good the encryption is? You can decode it, or you have a good chance of doing so. And uh, essentially, you know, we've all seen this with good old Debian when they uh, fixed OpenSSH uh, to not issue compiler warnings. Uh, but really, the library has lots of stuff where it goes, we don't know how to get random data. So the assumption in OpenSSL is, you know, hey, well, if we, we don't know if we can get random data, so, so let's fake it badly. Okay? Uh, and really, the library should not do this. User land shouldn't do this. Okay? OpenSSL's attempt has resulted in all sorts of horror. Uh, the entropy gathering demon, uh, the the enormous attack surface that no one should ever, ever run. Uh, we deleted that interface because we considered it actively hostile. Uh, if it was in there, it could be tricked into being turned on. You could provide an entropy gathering demon. Here, here's some entropy, trust me. Uh, <laughs> the library in all sorts of places at runtime can decide, oh no, we need something random, at which point it decides, oh gosh, but I'm about to generate something, I need something random. We have seen, definitely, your RSA key is pretty random. You can make, if you make OpenSSL check entropy thinger fail during RSA key generation, it will emit the intermediate stages of RSA key generation into the random subsystem to generate entropy. Because, well, it's better to have entropy than no entropy, right? If you can't do something right, do it bad. Um, we've seen, how many places have we deleted this in the code? Yeah, <laughs> or, or, I'm, I'm not kidding. <laughs> There is lots of little statics in that code, char, and it's some variant of string to give the random number generator entropy. Yeah, that's good. Or, of course, the usual get PID and get time of day. All this fun stuff. Since these were always there, again, it's an attack target. Even if your OS is using a reasonable source of entropy, if you can trick the library into saying, oh, I don't have enough entropy, it will fall back to using these methods. Yay! <laughs> Just what you want. No. LibreSSL entropy will be the responsibility of the operating system. If your operating system can't provide you with a good source of entropy, we will not fake it. Okay? We know we can't do it right. We can't. Forget it. So if you can't do it right, don't do it at all. And go back to the people who can do it right, which is the op I mean, in OpenBSD in the kernel, we do it right. And most major operating systems do it right-ish, or there's a way to do it right. Okay, so do it right. Fix your operating system, not the user land library. Okay, here's a nickel kid, get a real computer. Um, we've had a number of these issues. Uh, Joel has done a lot of work fixing the code. Um, the patient needs an emergency KNFectomy. I don't know how many know what KNF is? A few. Okay, it's the, generally the kernel normal form or BSDC coding style. Uh, the OpenSSL style is horrendous when it exists or when it's just random style within a file. Um, we've done a lot of stuff since we've decided we're going to fork it. We're not worrying about upstream. Let's make this code base readable. You know, you can like KNF or not KNF, lot like KNF. I don't care. I mean, it's just do something consistent. Do something consistent, documented to a standard that a lot of the rest of the world can understand so that a lot of the rest of the world can start looking at your code and seeing where there are issues. Many eyes actually make stuff better, not worse. And so we're KNFing the whole thing. If it makes it more readable, it sometimes makes the horrors visible, which is the point. And more readable hopefully means more developer involvement, more community involvement, not run away. Okay. Um, the OpenSSL bug tracking RT has been and continues to be a fantastic resource for us. Although a number of the people who are submitting bugs to them now give them to us first or at the same time because they've kind of noticed that we actually fix them and say thank you when we get them. So we, we like to do that. And uh, we've, uh, end users do report bugs there and they seem to go there to die. Uh, we, they still haven't fixed a lot. Of, are they still bike shedding that null pointer chase? Uh, yeah, well I think they just decided not to fix it. Well they decided not to fix it. Or, uh, okay, whatever. <laughs> There was, there was a, 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 a large bike shed going on. We were, we were, we were cheering the bike shedding session. Anyway, <laughs> and so we keep fixing things, and we 
they keep being passed up, and there we go. Was that one actually a CVE? Yeah. Yeah, they did have a CVE for that one. They just decided not to fix it. Uh, there's a way to, to uh, fiddle with the SSL. Um, it's the negotiation options such that you can trick the library into, follow, fo into following a null pointer. So if you actually look at it close enough, if you, people are running OpenSSL, you can crash anybody on a whim that, that runs it. Okay. Um, this, as I kind of alluded before, all the APIs are belong to include OpenSSL. Just about, they, I don't think they've ever heard of static. Or, or when they did, they redefined, pound defined static local. <laughs> kill, kill me now. Uh, but no, they uh, like to put absolutely everything into public header files. And the result is, is we have this enormous space of API that could potentially be used by external applications. And this is this kind of a big problem. Because there's a lot of this that probably shouldn't be used outside the library or isn't used outside the library, but we can't know for sure. We're slowly finding out, because if we change something or say nothing should use this, we delete it, we are our faithful ports guys in OpenBSD, run a ports build on nine architectures, and come back and go, oh, no, you can't do that. <laughs> Bad stuff has happened, so how are we going to fix it? And sometimes that's, oh, this is an easy fix in, the, in these few pieces of software. Let's make the changes and send them upstream, and that works. And sometimes it's, no, this is too painful. We'll, we'll go back to, to having it back in. So we're actively doing this all the time as part of this development process. It's a continual, let's fix the code. Let's, mod let's try to keep the API consistent. But let's do this continuous testing with the ports ports builds constantly. And the ports guys have been wonderful to us, even though we've been making their life kind of hell. So yeah. Um, we'd like to put the supposed API on a diet and remove some of the unused stuff. But for the moment, we're, as I said, we're being pretty cautious to try to make sure that we can stay compatible or mostly compatible with some of the ecosystem out there. There's a few things we just removed because they were outright dangerous and nothing should use them. Randy GD for one of them. Um, and I said, we've moved the library to use the intrinsics. We can't remove BioSprintf, CryptoMalloc, but we stop using them ourselves. We use regular malloc, calloc, realloc, sprintf, sterilcat, all those fun things. The strange APIs remain for compatibility, but we don't use them. Okay? Normal POSIX API use, hopefully more and easier developer involvement. Not, I have to figure out weird API. Yeah. Uh, no, I will not add sane API primitives to libssl because libssl is not libc. Your operating system provides you with libc in a standard interface for a reason. Use it. No, no. I mean, you're, you're not using weird things like BIOS and printf. No. But is there a way to talk to libssl that doesn't involve calling you know, API compatible crazy? Well, generally speaking, you don't need to, in an application, call OpenSSL malloc or bio. Mal bio sturdoop or things like that. You can choose in your application to just use the regular ones. There's no harm to it. Okay? So since that was always kind of optional in the first place. Now, do, do you still need to do like EVP interfaces to ciphers and stuff? Of course you do. That, those calls aren't going to change, but those aren't where the problem is. So, um, so some specific fun issues. BIOS and printf. This one, I, I, I'm going to continue a little poke back and forth with Theo Durat over it. And so far, I've lost. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to suck Ted into my cause. And we're, we're going to eventually OK each other's diff and just do it. Uh, bio SN printf is like SN printf, mostly. Except if you know SN printf, SN printf will return minus 1 if it fails. But normally, if SN printf tries to print into a string and, can't, and it would truncate, okay, it returns the length that it would have needed to, to uh, print everything you wanted into that string. So it will return a length bigger than what you limited it. It will still null terminate the string, so that's all good. And when you look at bio SN printf usage in OpenSSL, I went through and looked, and, and now the problem is this one doesn't do that. If it would truncate, it returns minus one every time. And so when people assume that SN printf behaves like SN printf, Bad things happen if they're actually calling BIOS and printf and it returns negative one instead of a large value that they are expecting. So um, I went through and actually pasted my way through this. There are about 500 calls to BIOS and printf in the library. Um, don't ask. Uh, about probably approximately 480 of them didn't check the return value at all. That's 
kind of okay if you don't care about truncation. We still have to go through them and make sure they actually should, shouldn't care about truncation, but let's assume that they were okay with that. Um, and about 20 of them looked at the return code. Of the 20 of them that looked at the return code, fully three quarters of them assumed that the thing actually returned what SN printf returns. And so it's like, don't change the API. You have to preserve this thing that returns negative one. And I'm looking at, given that about three quarters of the calls in the library are wrong, I'm betting about more than that are wrong in the outside ecosystem. And we should just change the API to be like SN printf. It would probably be no worse. So um, bio sturdoop is not normal. Uh, sturdoop, if you pass sturdoop a null pointer, it says bang. Uh, <laughs> you, you don't do that. Uh, this one conveniently ignores null. So we can't get rid of this interface or make it the same as the standard because we don't know how many applications out there are depending on that behavior. Um, error add error data. This is my favorite function, and I killed it. Um, it was responsible for so much horror show in this code. Why? Air add data is very simple. Air add data, give it a number. It's a var args function. The number is how many char star pointers you're going to give it. It simply takes them um, through a really arcane loop that had my name in it because I said something to Ben Laurie 15 years ago and I just couldn't stand it. Um, it. It then goes and just concatenates the strings together, malloc something, and sends it to the error thing and frees it. Well, the problem is, is that, OK, this is an error reporting function. What do you guys do when you, when you call an error in your code? You know, something printf, hey, you know, blah, blah equals foo, bar equals this number, this equals that number, think equals the, you know, something bad happened, thank you. Well, what this does, because this is the only interface they had, because, you know, some operating systems might have not have printf, so we have to accommodate these things. Um, instead, they would make 68,000 little string buffers on the stack, call stir copy or sterile copy or whatever to manually jam error equals foo equals printf a value into a little string, and then call error add data six and a whole bunch of things. So you'd end up with this gymnastics this long to produce an error message every time. Um, and uh, at least one of these two of these, which is probably the original source 15 years ago that I told Ben Laurie, hey, you should fix that, was one where it was air add data four and two pointers added. So it would just take whatever was on the stack and stuff it in there. And maybe it was null. And maybe it was random memory. And we don't care. Uh, we replaced it with asprintf. So what you're saying is it would be easier just to tell malloc to dump the entire contents of memory. Well, no, in this particular case, yeah. Because, but, but no, but, but here, we just replaced it with asprintf. Hey, so we have an error as printf data, which takes printf format args and takes all these blocks of goo and trans, turns them down into one sane call to, hey, make error message. Fine. Um, and I think I quoted on ICB, and I've been re-quoted by Ted. <laughs> you know it's going to be good when the function starts with that. <laughs> and by the way, that one is still in there. Because I've tried to rewrite it a few times, and I've been just given up in annoyance and frustration, because it's a dumb function, and it doesn't matter for anything. Oh, yes. Lovely. No, 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 no. This is, this is normal open SSL coding style. You, don't, you always hard code numbers in, and you don't know about the function size of, probably because Visual C doesn't understand size of. So after you've done that, you have to make sure you use the same hard coded number in all your calls to things that are acknowledging the size of this object. There's been a big sweep of, hey, you guys really should use size of when you're doing this. And that's been fun, too. So no, that's, that's normal. Remember what I said? The horrible chases people away. So some of the lols. <laughs> there have been a few lols. The best one I will talk about is big Indian AMD 64 support. I'm not kidding you. You're running OpenSSL. Your library supports big Indian AMD 64. Why does it support big ND and AMD 64? Because somewhere out there, there was some company that picked up probably somebody's master's thesis where they made a virtual machine, probably QMU, and hacks to GCC to have a big ND and i386. And they compiled OpenSSL for it. Yeah? Cisco has a compiler that Intel wrote for them that generates. Jeez, Jesus, Warner, don't tell me this. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, they could use this. Anyway, it has big Indian AMD 64 support. Thank you, Warner. I'm now thinking about where my parents made me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, stop it. <laughs> anyway, the excuse was, by the way, this code had never been tested and it was broken because, because they did it in this project, somebody might do it for AMD 64, so the code should be there and be ready. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Ted, you get to do number two. Yeah, uh, so there's well, millions of things that you can turn off um, where you compile a library with no X built You can't off. turn off the debugging malloc, but you can turn off sockets. Yeah, except that this one can't. <laughs> no, I, I'm not kidding. <laughs> you can turn off sockets. You can turn off sockets. It does something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but VMS doesn't have sockets. <laughs> yeah, we know. Yeah, it's not tested at all. Anyway, we ripped all that out. Um, fun with SockLen T. Okay, if your operating system doesn't have SockLen T, it's either a size T or it's an int. It's going to be one or the other, right? Who's going to explain this one, you or me? You can do it. You can do Sock. This was just horrendous. Every time after you call accept. You have to look inside the union to see which word of union was overwritten. Um, but then you have a problem because an HTTPA, the stack grows up. So then you have to add a check for that. And you don't actually, so the number that they pass into accept is actually like 16 gigabytes um, as the claim size of stock adder. But that's OK, because accept shouldn't write that much data. Um, and then they have a assert after it that they didn't actually overflow the stack. And they do this on every every app. call to accept. <laughs> oh, this is instead of finding out Sockland. This is instead of just saying, oh shit, pound to find Sockland T int. Yeah. yeah. But the good news is that if Sockland, if the size of Sockland T changes while your program is running, OpenSSL will cope. <laughs> One of the other things it copes for is if dev null moves while your process is running, <laughs> it will figure it out. It's very portable. OK. Um, the ASA infinite gerbling extension. <laughs> this is an academic paper written for the, is it the infinite garbling extension? Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is a mode for AES that somebody figured out might have wonderful magic, which uses four keys and four IVs. Two. No, four. <laughs> yes. The code in OpenSSL then says it uses, well, the paper says four keys and four IVs are good enough, so we're going to implement four keys and two because it's probably OK. Um, however, what the, and there's a test vector, so you can test to see if this actually does the right thing. But the code actually only uses one key and one IV, and the test vector was generated with the test code. So <laughs> as near as we can tell, this code is in there. It can be enabled at any time at runtime, but has never been tested and never does what it says it does. So we removed it. Yeah. Um, that was gone. That was a couple of good lols. And uh, hello, Bueller? Ugh. Something's dead. Give me a minute. Are you running open SSL? Yeah. <laughs> My X hung. Give me a sec. We're going to have to do the trick again. I will continue. Um, no idea. The dribble was too much. The was too much. <laughs> I am running current. We have some issues. 
Um, so if you give me a minute here, uh, why don't you take a minute and discuss uh, what was some of the other ones we've picked up? Oh, okay, yes, it's time to discuss, because I know what's on the starting on the next slide. Uh, pragma pointer size 32. Oh. <laughs> Pragma summon Cthulhu. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other great one we found was uh, how many of you know what ROP is? Return oriented programming. In a nutshell, if you're an attacker and uh, your address space is, uh, you can't write into executable address space, one of the great techniques, amongst others, is to find return oriented programming. You find addresses you can jump to that do an epilogue of a function and return, 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 that do what you want. And you chain the addresses together and you get the existing code to do something that it doesn't want to do. Um, OpenSSL has a very helpful uh, function in it for ROP programmers. Uh, <laughs> I forget the name of it, or at least I won't put it in the talk. Finding it is an exercise for the reader, uh, which is written in assembler. And uh, just basically this function, what the hell was it for? Uh, oh, it's on Windows, if you call a function pointer, you don't know whether to call standard call or fast call conventions. Yeah, that's so this it. This calls it and then checks the stack pointer and fixes it for you afterwards. Yeah. Um, and so it'll call any address and fix the stack pointer after you. It's wonderful, helpful function that's there in OpenSSL. Uh, backwards compatibility for a state mistake that lasted a month. Uh, there's code in there that says this will be removed soon for 095. 095 happened 14 years ago. They made a typo in the arguments. Uh, so then they add backward compatibilities to keep that argument there. It was fixed in 096 a month later. So the mistake lasted a month 14 years ago. The hack is still in there. We deleted it. Was the, it was their lucky day, as Ted said. Um, the thing that wasn't actually it was probably the, I've been called the first person to weaponize Comic Sans. Um, because when we announced the name and we quickly brought up a page sitting on my couch, the reason I did this was actually, I was initially copying the OpenSSH page, and I knew that because the OpenSSH page, everybody who's into web design yells that we live in 1995, and this web page is terrible because it has actual information on it and not just dancing graphics and, and HTML5 movies. 
So I knew I would get yelled at that the web page sucks anyway. So I said, if I'm going to get yelled at for the web page sucking, I'm going to make it suck gloriously. <laughs> and I promptly put it on Comic Sans and Blink Tag and said, donate to stop the blinking. Um, I, I just wish that the world had more people who would actually complain about the quality of the as in one code than a website in Comic Sans. But anyway, um, we, we continue. Uh, I believe, and it's not, it's a pro, it's kind of approximate because it just hits PayPal at approximately that time. We probably picked up about twenty-five to forty thousand dollars in PayPal donations for that web page. So, okay, I could, I could take it. Um, OpenSSL 1.0 and G was a three hundred eighty-eight thousand line code base. Uh, as of yesterday, we'd ripped out about ninety thousand, but that's ripping out and adding new stuff because we've actually added some new stuff, some stuff back to it. Uh, about 150 lines of 1,000 lines of files are deleted. So it's 90,000 lines of C and headers and 150,000 lines of other files. Perl, shell, VMS, batch files. I've, <laughs> there's stuff in there you don't even want to know. It's just delete, delete, delete. It's about a half million line unified diff from 101G at this point. Many bugs have been fixed. Um, probably about a week and a half ago, we said, OK, the cleaning is done, or it's not done, but the cleaning has progressed enough that we can start adding new stuff. So we're bringing things in from newer releases of OpenSSL and from outside. The code has become a lot more readable. Portions of it are still scary, particularly the ASIN1 and the X509 code, which every time I wake up and Miode has a different diff for me to review in ASIN1, I kind of groan and swear at him a little bit. Yeah? Are you still using the Perl script to generate the no. Oh, the assembly, yes. The assembly, yes. But no, I thought we were, but we're, we're trying to move away from it. Uh, we, are, we are fixing it and trying to move away from at least as, as scary as it is. So having said that, the assembler stuff, when done correctly, does speed up the library considerably. So we, it still needs to stick around. Um, <clears throat> We've continued to update libcrypto, and we are asking authors for decently licensed versions. Uh, it's already been successful in a number of cases. So we've brought in uh, a number of cipher suites that were not in 101G. So we've brought in Brainpool, ChaCha, Poly1305, uh, the French government, elliptic curve, hold that thought, uh, and a few of the new uh, SSL cipher suites based on combinations of AES and the above there. So those have been, been added in, uh, often either from OpenSSL coming back from later versions or asking authors out there for a reasonably licensed version. We've gotten good licensed versions from Google. We've gotten good licensed versions from a number of other contributors. And a few things that we've had to disable because they were just broken uh, and poorly licensed, like, for example, Ghost. We've had some, some discussions with the authors to give us back a version that works uh, that's appropriately licensed. Uh, somebody had, yeah? Yeah, that's why. Uh, hold that thought, because I'm out of time. I'll take it at the end. Why? OK, we'll get there. Uh, FIPS mode is gone. It's never coming back. Uh, we think the OpenSSL Foundation is basically a FIPS consultancy. We are not. We think this kind of creates a priority inversion for what they want to do with the library versus what we want to do with the library. You guys decide where your priorities are. Okay. Uh, we think there's more than enough room in the ecosystem for multiple implementations. People needing FIPS can use OpenSSL. Uh, we're not, it's not a goal for us, and we're not bringing it back. So having said that, non-harm, FIPS is very intrusive. It got, its tendrils are all through the library. It makes a nightmare of it. Uh, other ciphers, however, we don't think that's necessarily bad. So your question why, perhaps? Governments mandate use of certain ciphers. Camilla, Gost, uh, the Asin one, French government, uh, brain, uh, elliptic curve, a few things like that. As long as they're not on by default, OK? And as long as they're there, rather than having the poor turkey who has to maintain a site that is mandated to do this, to have to have, oh, if gross hack to turn on my government cipher, otherwise EVP regular cipher, we say, no, let's put it in as long as we can get it on a reasonably licensed version and make sure that that upstream code can stay clean and hopefully more bug free. OK? Yeah? Is a problem, yes. But yes. There's, there's no problems with doing FIPS with OpenSSL, but you need to rip out all the stuff that they Yeah, and, and, and if somebody wants to certify LibreSSL for FIPS, we're very happy to you know, go ahead, but we're not going to make code changes for it. Right. Well, nobody can certify the library itself without trying to do a software module, which is a you know, yeah. 
Okay. So if your system is going to run Libracell, there will be a few things that you need. Essentially, modern POSIX-like environment. You know what? Even Windows has this these days, guys. We don't need to do all these hacks back to crazy versions of stuff. Um, the OS absolutely must provide a good source of random data. It's uh, readiness and quality, like readiness, meaning that when we ask for it, we get it, not block, or if you, unless you're supposed to block. Uh, and the quality of it are the responsibility of the operating system, not Libra SSL. And they never will be. Okay, uh, so if you want to port to your operating system, you better make sure you do that right. Uh, because the port, really the port can't even do that for you. Uh, and then there's some other stuff that you should have, but maybe we can deal with you in portability. Proper malloc free, calloc realloc, and realloc array with overflow checking for the multiplication of arguments. Modern C string capabilities, sterl cat, copy, as printf. Um, explicit B0 is an open BSDism we use everywhere. It is make sure the compiler doesn't optimize away zeroing this thing at the end of the function because it will. GCC will be helpful and say that's dead code, you don't need to zero that memory. That's often not what you want to do in a cryptographic library. Uh, realloc array, as I mentioned. And the portability team does need to be careful. We have seen multiple haphazard ports already that are basically completely broken. Hi, I'm making this work on Linux. Oh, I don't have explicit B0. We'll just make that B0. Oh, look, it compiles. I've ported it. Yay! Um, I don't have ARC4 random. Oh, I'll just call, call random and seed it with get PID. Yay! It compiles. I've ported it. Okay? The goals of a porter are sometimes not the goals of somebody who's actually trying to make the library work right. And so we want to get an actual Libre SSL portability team working with us for those operating systems that cares about the port working right not just having a port, okay? So, longer term goals, we wanna have a better replacement or reduced API, uh, reduce the code base even more, split out non-crypto things from lib crypto. Lib crypto should really be about crypto, not about a billion repackaging, badging, and layers of trust and certification. That almost probably more belongs in LibreSSL. That's a, a, an ongoing debate on our part. But at least there's a lot of stuff in libcrypto, including replacements for half the functions in libc, that should probably really not belong in libcrypto. We want to get it out. And split libcrypto from libssl. Right now, it's basically impossible to use one without the other um, or, and to build one without the other. It would be nice to be able to have, offer the ability to deal with them separately. So. Challenges, as I've said, an extensive public API that needs to be modernized. Some major pieces need to be rewritten completely. And there's a lot of stuff we can do easily with volunteers. This is one that probably needs somebody some dedicated time to actually rewrite that layer, uh, if it's even possible. And so it's time and resources, it's money. So what are we looking for when that site says it wants a funding commitment? We're looking for a stable funding commitment to the OpenBSD Foundation so we can sponsor several developers to rewrite some key pieces of that code. We, we probably know who we'd sponsor. That's not a problem. It's a question of uh, having the resources to be able to do that. Uh, we want to sponsor some of the efforts of the portability ports people to keep up with the effects of those changes that those people are making uh, and keep the upstream ecosystem informed so that the library remains compatible and most of the upstream world remains compatible with the library. So in a nutshell, a significant funding commitment of a couple of years. We'd like to speed, so that would speed the rewrite and speed the cleaning up of this immensely. Uh, we'd love to just do it, but we don't want to do it at the expense of our usual resources, which are somewhat meager, uh, to maintain OpenBSD, OpenSSH, and related stuff. And yes, we've asked the Linux Foundation people, that thing that was in the news. We have asked. I've been talking to Jim Zielinski. Uh, they have not yet committed to support us. Haven't said no, haven't said yes. So frankly, we want sponsorship. If your employer is interested in assisting, talk to me. I'm a director. Or email to fundraising at openbsdfoundation.org. We definitely would be interested in talking to you. Uh, so summary, it's awful, but it can get fixed. Uh, it's, it's awful, PHK was right. Uh, but we can fix it probably with a number of effort. We've got a very good start on cleaning it up. It's certainly a lot better than it was a month ago. Um, we know where we want to go with this, and we want to bring the rest of the community along. So please support us and help us out publicly. Okay? And uh, that's it. Okay. Questions? Yes? Uh, is this your take on a malice or a 
Uh, never attribute to, well, oh man. <laughs> I would say it, I tend to not be a, 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 a conspiracy theorist, but it's really hard to not get the conspiracy theorist out when you when the company's registered in Maryland. <laughs> but I, I honestly think a lot of it is, is, is not necessarily deliberate incompetence or deliberate incompetence or, or deliberate malice. It's just a case of the code base started to go that way and nobody put the time or effort in to fix it. And nobody had enough of a strong hand to say this can't stay this way. Yeah. Will there be Libra SSL songs? I don't know. I don't <laughs> write songs. Oh, I, I think I probably lie about that. I've written a few of the OpenBSD songs, but I certainly don't sing. Yes. Like which mainstream ciphers? Around like KES and the yeah. actual crypto is good. For the most part is well done. Well done. Not really messing with that. Uh, I mean, there, for a couple of the things, I think there are maybe some edge like timing attacks uh, and very some, some subtle things where that can always be improved. But that that extends a little bit beyond our core competency. But there's a few people in our in our group that work with it. Uh, I think that, you know, but, but like I said, by and large, and I've said this publicly before, the crypto is usually pretty good. The crypto was actually written by cryptographers, and all the crypto bits usually, with the exception of like the infinite gerbling extension, have a, a very, you know, well put up test suite that you run. You run the regress suites. It's pretty obvious at least it does what it's supposed to do, um, and, and we work with it that. But you've got to understand, if there's, you know, 300,000 lines of code in Libra SSL, uh, I'll just make a guess. Maybe 30,000 of it is crypto, and the rest of it, SSL is not crypto. SSL is a protocol converter. It's, it's a protocol conversion layer and a bundling stuff up and X509s and this and that. It's all the regular string bashing and throwing stuff on the network that we're used to with every other set of daemons. The crypto is a very small piece of this library. Sorry? Yeah, well, BN is already being shredded as we speak. Okay. So you're, you're talking about BN or you're talking about as in one integer? Uh, I, I, I was talking about BN. Yeah, BN is being shredded okay. as we speak. Uh, BN has already been shredded to the point of we have fixed a number of issues with termination of it, a number of edge cases with it, and BN in Libra SSL. Now, every time you work with a BN, uh, when you when you get stop working with that BN, it is explicitly B zeroed. Uh, yes, we take the cost of explicitly wiping memory on every BN operation, but in our experience, the only thing you're using BNs for in that library are cryptographic operations where we should throw away the intermediates. And if you happen to be using BN outside for non-cryptographic things, we're terrible people. We just made it a little slower for you. Yeah, it's, <laughs> that's not the worst of the horror in there, trust me, but I know it's, it's ugly, yeah. Uh, my, my other question, uh, while you're looking for the code that really goes wrong in modern libraries, uh, can you still read 40 bit enforceable mesh code? No, uh, not yet, because there are way too many, we've tried. <laughs> um, we did it. <laughs> Remember we did in Morocco, and the ports people immediately got their torch and pitchforks and uh, came after Ted and me and a few other people. They, what the hell are you doing? Uh, because frankly, there's too many other outside projects in the ecosystem that depend upon that, okay? That still use single DES in a variety of applications, even for like, say, supporting legacy Unix passwords. Um, just because it's in the library doesn't, you know, now, now let's put this another way. Um, do you want to take stir copy out of libc? It, it, it should, but we're not going to because it, you know the standards mandate it. The answer is don't use it, and you know. So, if you want to talk about library reductions, would we eventually perhaps get rid of ciphers? Yes, we've thrown away a few, but um, right now on the first go around, our goal is to maintain compatibility with the upstream ecosystem and clean it up, not go on a holy crusade for the world should not use crappy crypto. The world should not use crappy crypto is don't use it. Yeah, perhaps, but, but that's, that's a separate issue. And so we can either cut off our nose to spite our face 
and make sure that you know FreeBSD has to make the decision that if we import LibreSSL, a whole bunch of stuff in our ports tree will break, so we won't. Or we can keep that there and leave those few things of broken software in the ports tree and, and continue to provide better versions of what really people really should be using. Yeah? So you compared it to strict copy. Strict copy. Strict copy. Being in libc. Strict copy of get and a few other yeah. things. You spit out a local warning if anyone uses the function. Mm -hmm. Are you planning on doing the same thing? No. I don't think it's technically feasible. Yeah. It's not called by a, a function, it's called by blah, and you're not going to notice in the linker. At the, at the end of the day, if I, if I need to build a product that I can ship to Russia, I need to use crappy crypto. <laughs> yeah, and that's okay. Yeah. Yep. We, we have to wrap it up pretty quick, so any more questions? And if not, uh, I'll be here afterwards, I'll hang out outside, and there's a birds of feather session at noon, so thank you for coming. Um, Thanks for having me.